the timing of this Adelaide launch of the Renewable Energy Superpower <coughs> one month out from the federal election, we have changed tack somewhat by inviting a, a panel of our elected representatives to come and speak to us about their policies that they might have in place. And I'm very glad to welcome both uh, Mark Butler, Honourable Mark Butler, MP, and also Senator Robert Sims, who's the Greens, to our event. But before I bring them to the panel to actually come and speak to you, I thought it was just important just to let you know that we did try to invite Nick Xenophon, but he's unfortunately in Melbourne uh, today. But we do have a representative from his party in the audience, so we're glad to have them present today. And we worked reasonably hard to have a member of the coalition present because we thought they might like to be here given that they just had three ministers signing a low carbon emissions policy last week. But unfortunately, uh, none had time in their schedules. But we're very grateful for the elected representatives we do have because there's certainly no uh, lack of evidence that policy uncertainty leads to investor uncertainty. So could I welcome you both to come and sit up the front. And I'll introduce Mark Butler to speak first. He's uh, currently the Labor Shadow Minister for the Environment, Climate Change and Water, and also the National President of the Australian Labor Party. One thing that I hadn't known um, about Mark is that he'd actually been awarded the Alzheimer's Disease International Award for Outstanding Global Contribution to the Fight Against Dementia. So as somebody who cared for my own mother till she died, I honour you greatly for that contribution. It's an enormous humanitarian thing to be doing in the current world. Um, I'll let you speak for yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming out on a Friday evening and thank you, Philip and Stephen, uh, for your presentations. Uh, Stephen and I actually launched this report in Sydney. I'll say that that was even better the second time. Well, it's probably not the second time you've done that. Um, can I really pay credit to the work that BZE does? Uh, Stephen was right to point out some, some of the landmark work they do. It's always dense, it's always very detailed, uh, but it is incredibly important. It's an important contribution to a very fast moving debate for policy makers to have organisations that are objective, well qualified, uh, pushing the envelope, constantly presenting new material for us to think about, to challenge us, to, to urge us to become more ambitious. And I'm glad you were not too modest, as you were in the Sydney launch, Stephen, to point out the fact that uh, BZE was the only Australian organisation to get into that very prestigious top 10 think tanks to watch in 2016. And I think that really is a great credit to the work that your organisation has been doing now for some years and is continuing to do, Stephen. This is, um, we did the launch, I think, before the campaign had been called in Sydney, but this is a very topical uh, thing for us to be discussing, not just because there is a federal election, uh, but because, as Stephen pointed out, we're still somewhat in the warm afterglow of a remarkably successful conference in Paris. Remarkable in the sense that it was only six years ago that we experienced the division and the disappointment of Copenhagen. And six years, uh, for United Nations multilateral processes is the blink of an eye. It really is remarkable just how far we've come in the, in the past six years. And Stephen is right, there is much more to do. And the, the sum total of the indicative national determined contributions or the targets that nations brought to the conference takes us closer to three degrees of warming, let alone well below two degrees or a more qualified commitment around 1.5. So there's much, much more to do, but it really was a remarkable conference. And there's been a great deal of, I think, really useful discussion about why it was remarkable. Uh, it's true that the French and the UN managed the conference extraordinarily well, saving except for the catering. You could not get at the world's largest environmental conference in the world, for love or money, a vegetarian catering option, which is just <laughs> bizarre, but that's the, that's the French. They love putting ham or some variant of pig in almost everything that would appear. But it was otherwise a very, very skillfully managed conference. Getting those targets ahead of time, getting the leaders to the beginning of the conference, uh, really, really put the pressure on all the nations to come up with an agreement at the end. And I think we knew going to the conference that the contours had largely been set. I think the American and Chinese leadership was enormously important. 
Uh, I mean, that really was the, the key fracture at Copenhagen. And nowadays, uh, if the, friend, if the uh, Chinese and the Americans agree to something, it usually happens. And they very much have decided 18 months out to ensure that momentum kept building to, 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 a, to a successful conclusion at the Paris conference. And I think that was enormously important. But the thing that struck me, and I was privileged to be able to spend a few days at the conference, the thing that struck me that was reinforced by some poor souls who'd been to all 21 of the conferences <coughs> was the enormous change in the business outlook. The enormous change. The coal industry was essentially invisible. If they were there, no one really knew where they were and what they were doing. Were they been very bolshy, very upfront, very aggressive in their lobbying at each of the previous 20 COPs. But this time, business was there represented arguing for global carbon prices arguing for ambitious renewable energy policies, showing off what they've been doing in their home countries to deliver the sort of investment that Stephen was talking about. It, it is utterly clear that in spite of good management, good leadership from the Americans and the Chinese and some others, really what mattered in that Paris conference is the fact that nations across the world are shifting. They're shifting really fast. Uh, the, the renewable energy investment statistics for last year confirmed that for the first time in our history <coughs> more money was invested in renewable energy in 2015 than the combined investment in coal, gas, hydro and nuclear power. And we can be pretty confident that things are never going to change back. And it's across the world. I mean China is undoubtedly leading the way. They invested last year more than the combined investment in renewables in America and the EU. Uh, they have lifted their targets for 2020 to something like 150 gigawatts of solar by 2020 and 280 gigawatts of wind by 2020. Just to give you some sort of context, our entire electricity system is around 50 gigawatts. They added 50 gigawatts of renewable energy just last year. Just last year, 50 gigawatts of renewable energy. But it's not just China. Uh, India, as I think people know, has some very ambitious targets, particularly around solar. Uh, the US has pretty much closed 200 of its 500 coal-fired power stations in the last five years, or at least nominated very proximate dates for their closure. A Tory government in the UK announced just before Paris that their last coal-fired power station will close in the early 2020s. This is a shift happening across the world. We recognise in Australia it's not going to be an easy transition. It's going to be a bigger transition than it will be for most. And that is because we, for a very long time, have been a heavily emissions intensive economy. We produce the highest amount of pollution per head of population in the OECD. No one puts out more carbon pollution into the atmosphere per person than Australia does. And we also produce more pollution per unit of GDP than any other country in the OECD, with the very unusual exception of Estonia. I don't know what's happening in Estonia. Someone, maybe VZ can do a report about what's happening in Estonia. But we are second in that table. We produce about three times as much pollution per unit of GDP as Japan, more than twice as much as the UK and Germany, almost twice as much as America. We have a very, very long way to go, very long way to pull that carbon pollution down. And that is essentially, although not exclusively, essentially due to the fact that we have a heavily polluting electricity sector. Our electricity sector is more heavily polluting per megawatt hour than China's. It's 87% more polluting than the OECD average. It simply must get cleaner, and it must get cleaner quickly. And herein lies the opportunity. They're the challenges. The opportunity is that in electricity, as Stephen has pointed out, unlike many other sectors of the economy, the technology is already there. And it is constantly getting cheaper, and it's constantly getting better. Constantly getting better. And although we do have a lot of coal and gas and uranium, and that's built an impressive economy over many decades, we also have, as Stephen has said, some of the best solar radiation in the world. Across the south of the continent, we have some of the best wind energy in the world, some of the best wave energy in the Southern Ocean, great tidal energy up in the north of the continent, and we have some of the best scientists and the most innovative businesses just wanting to do this. But most of all, we can be confident about those opportunities because we have been a renewable energy superpower. In 2013, 
we were universally rated across the world as one of the foremost, foremost attractive destinations for renewable energy investment in the globe, up with China, the US and Germany. And there's no, no, really, no argument why we were doing that. Over the course of our time in government, we increased the number of households with solar panels on them in six years, from 7,000 in 2007 to 1.3 million in 2013. Over that period, we tripled wind power. We tripled the number of jobs in the renewable energy industry. We, in 2013, approved the largest PV solar farm in the Southern Hemisphere the largest wind farm in the Southern Hemisphere. We were a renewable energy superpower. Carbon pollution was coming down, not just in the electricity sector, but in the economy more broadly, by about 8% over those six years. But all of that changed in 2014. And one car crash of a radio interview that Tony Abbott did with Alan Jones, you might have heard of him in Sydney, it all changed. That bipartisanship, which really went back to John Howard in the early part of the last decade, was smashed in one radio interview, and investor confidence was smashed with it. In 2014, renewable energy investment in the large-scale sector collapsed by 88%, while it was skyrocketing everywhere else in the world. We lost 3,000 jobs, almost, over that period of time. And this has been a terrible thing for invest investor confidence. Unsurprisingly, as I think Hugh will point out, carbon pollution started to rise again. After coming down for the first time in our history, carbon pollution started to rise again in the electricity sector, and it also started to rise in other sectors of the economy, like land clearing, because of changes made to Queensland's land clearing laws, but we're not here to talk about that tonight. So things are very, very grim around renewables here. Some applaud the fact that we put on about one gigawatt of solar capacity in 2015, as I understand it. One gigawatt sounds pretty good. The UK put four gigawatts of solar capacity, a country where the sun shines, as far as I can tell, about three days per year. <laughs> we have a very, very long way to go. We need real ambition, and we want that ambition to be a subject of discussion in this election campaign. We've put out a very, very detailed policy around renewable energy and climate change. It runs to 43 pages. Uh, Kevin came to the 2007 election and said, I'll sign Kyoto and I'll put in place an emissions trading scheme and everyone went, yay, you can't do that anymore. We need detail. Uh, and in energy, we've put a very substantial amount of detail after very deep consultation across the community and with the sector about what's best. There is, as Stephen said, a 50% renewable energy target in there. Over the course of the 2020s, depending on what you think will happen to demand, but on best estimates, of the course of the 2020s, that will mean we need to build about 2,000 megawatts of large-scale renewables every year for the whole decade. The most we've ever done is about 1,000 in the boom year of 2013. It's a very, very big build for that period of time over the 2020s. We also have recognised, though, and interestingly, this came from the thermal sector as well as the renewable sector, as well as the business council, we've also recognised the NEM needs a complete overhaul. This is only a 20-year-old system. 20 years ago was an entirely different era for electricity. This is an era that does not recognise decarbonisation. It's not an objective of the system. It does not recognise the idea of distributed generation. It just doesn't comprehend it, let alone storage, which is coming very, very fast to the system now. Every time we try to put in place a policy like the RET or some other policy seeking to bring down carbon pollution or empower consumers, it's like putting a square peg into a round hole. We have to do a complete root and branch review of the national electricity market. We have to create space for renewables to grow and we have to start shutting coal-fired power stations. We've adopted a model that the ANU came up with last year to kickstart the closure of the oldest, dirtiest coal-fired power stations in a way that's orderly, in a way that supports those regional communities in diversifying their economies. Their economies that were essentially were built on coal-fired power. We've got to kickstart that closure and have a long-term framework to transition completely out of coal into renewables. And we want that review of the NEM to come up with some ideas about whether that's an age-based transition or an emissions intensity-based transition. 
We've also said we need grants to start building concentrated solar thermal. We don't think a loan facility will suffice for this. We've got a $200 million targeted grant of a round of funding from ARENA specifically to support concentrated solar thermal. And one of the things that we've been very passionate about is ensuring that that solar revolution that Stephen talked about and I mentioned, that growth from 7,000 households less than 10 years ago now to 1.5 million having rooftop solar panels is not just a revolution for owner-occupiers, but is a revolution for people who live in private rental, public housing or apartment-style living who essentially now are shut out of the solar revolution. So our $100 million community renewables project will start to build those hubs those projects will start to ensure that all Australians have access to a solar revolution. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. I look forward to your gentle probing questions as my friends in Adelaide audience. We want this to be part of the election campaign. I know Robert's party wants this to be part of an election campaign. I'm not convinced Malcolm Turnbull wants this debate to be part of an election campaign. Let's make him be part of this debate. Thank you very much. Progress towards getting both a revised electricity grid and a renewable. Um, can I introduce Senator Robert Sims? He's the newest representative of the Greens in the federal parliament, and he took office as a senator in 2015, before which he was on the Adelaide City Council, and he's been a strong voice for progressive values, promoting greener streets, better cycling infrastructure, ethical investment, and improved access for people with disabilities. Can I welcome? Thank you very much everybody and uh, it's great to be here with you at the halfway point of this mammoth election campaign. It's hard to believe we're four weeks in and still another four weeks to go and I agree with Mark, so far Malcolm Turnbull has dodged this uh, issue of climate change and global warming and the discussion around renewable energy. But it is a critical issue for our state and our nation. And uh, it's up to us in the community to keep the pressure on and ensure that we get answers from the government on these questions. So thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see your interest in these issues. I thought what I'd do a little bit tonight is talk firstly about the Greens' uh, federal election platform and our plans at a national level but then also talk about the uh, South Australian aspect of that and the implications for our state of uh, the Greens policy and some of the, the opportunities that we think will flow as we transition away from coal and carbon here in South Australia. It is a challenging time for our state. We're seeing significant job uh, losses and of course the system unemployment and indeed the highest in the nation. But we believe that by moving to clean energy, renewable energy, we can create new jobs for the future. There's some real opportunity for us here in South Australia as our economy transitions. So in terms of our national plan, the Greens last year announced our new policy, Renew Australia. And that's a plan for 90% renewables by 2030 and a plan for energy efficiency to be doubled. And to help achieve that, we would dedicate $500 million to a new government authority called Renew Australia that would be tasked with planning and driving the transition to a new clean energy system to leverage $5 billion of construction in new energy generation over the next four years. We'd also create a $250 clean energy transition fund which would assist people working in the coal industry and communities during this transition. And you know, as Mark has said, there are uh, communities dealing with these issues of transition at the moment, and we recognise they need to be supported. We also want to have uh, pollution intensity standards that enable the gradual and staged closure of coal-fired power stations, starting with the dirtiest coal stations in the nation, starting over in Hazelwood 
and moving through. We do need to deal with that. And this plan, Renew Australia, we think has some really exciting opportunities for our state. You know, I've only been in the Senate for nine months and during that time, it's very clear to me that jobs is the key issue here in South Australia. It's, it's been raised with me um, everywhere I go, actually. Uh, here in the city, but also in regional South Australia, and I've spent time in places like Port Augusta, but also Wyala. It's an issue that people raise with me consistently. What are you going to do about jobs, and what are your plans for jobs? And that's where I think our plan for moving to renewables and our very ambitious target provides some really exciting opportunities, because we have a 90% target for 2030 of renewable energy, but we have a 100% target here in South Australia because we do recognise the good work that's already been done in that regard, but of course that means we can go further and we need to keep the pressure on to do that. And there are a huge amount of benefits that would flow from that increased focus on renewable energy here in South Australia. We've got hundreds of jobs that are going to be lost in Holden and Mitsubishi through the uh, closure of um, the automotive industry. Um, but we've also got jobs that will be lost uh, through Alinta in, in Port Augusta. And so we need to look at how we can harness the skills and experience of our state's manufacturing industry. And that's where renewable energy has some real opportunities. We can harness the skills and experience of our manufacturing industry, but also harness the sun to create some of those new jobs and uh, repower our state's economy. You know, it's interesting, often when we talk about climate change and energy policy, there seems to be this view, and traditionally that's been advocated by um, conservative forces in this debate, that you know, somehow we need to turn off the lights and sit around in hair shirts and that, you know, that's the end of, um, of electricity use. But of course we know that we can actually boost our energy by boosting uh, investment in renewable energy. We don't need to choose between energy consumption and renewable energy. If we actually invest in renewables, we can be a, uh, an energy superpower. And uh, there are huge opportunities that flow from that. We know that our plan to move to 100% renewables here in South Australia would create a thousand new jobs, full-time jobs in design and construction over the next 15 years, at a time when we really do need that boost here in South Australia. We're also very supportive in the Greens of the plan for solar thermal in Port Augusta. I recently had the opportunity to visit Port Augusta, I spoke to the local council, met with some representatives in the community and talked about their plans for solar thermal in that region and it's something that the Greens are 100% behind and we've been backing that community plan over many years. We want to see $100 million being made available through ARENA as a grant so that we can support the Port Augusta solar thermal plant. We really need to see this project go ahead for our state. It's critically important here in South Australia for jobs in the region, but also for South Australia's energy needs, and it would provide some real sustainable alternatives. So we want to see that happen. We're also committed to retaining funding for ARENA, and that's something that we think is really critical, and that is a point of difference between the Greens and the other political parties, the Labor and Liberal parties this election, because we want to, we want to retain the $1 billion funding for ARENA. It's really critical that we do that. And that's a critical part of driving this renewable energy revolution here in South Australia. So we're going to keep on fighting for the integrity of that system. And we're also going to keep on fighting for an ambitious target to ensure that South Australia really realises its full potential. We're also supporting, in addition to uh, our focus on renewables, a range of other measures as well that are about trying to transition away from the carbon economy. Things like electric cars here in South Australia that would reduce emissions but also play their part in creating new jobs for the future. It's interesting that traditionally there's been this dichotomy between the environment on the one hand and the economy on the other, but I think people in the community are starting to recognise that actually we can't have effective economic policy if we don't have 
uh, effective environmental policy. And actually what's good for the environment is also good for our economy. And that's particularly clear in the area of renewables. So that's the cornerstone of our renewable energy policy this election. And uh, we're certainly out, that, uh, out around the country selling that over this election campaign. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you all tonight and for your interest in this issue. I look forward to your questions. Go easy on me though. It's been a, um, a long week. Um, but I look forward to talking to you a bit more about our renewal plans. Thank you. Thank you.